All right, we're back with the Garlic Marketing Show. We're going to talk about how one agency helped grow in a luggage brand, a lifestyle brand, 142%. We're going to talk about that happening during COVID, how they shifted, how they shift, how to identify the shifts, the fundamentals of that e-commerce strategy for a lifestyle brand, um, how they're ch changing the consideration phase, and then we're going to get into testing, the key pieces to great tests, what really impacts a test, how to choose what tests to make, and then how they are scaling brands. Samir Belwani from Aquaria, thanks for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. Thank you. And uh, don't forget, this is brought to you by VideoCaseStory.com. Uh, one of the best ways to uh, tell the story of your brand, whatever it is, is through your client and customer stories. Go to VideoCaseStory.com to learn how we can help you craft and deliver those video case stories. All right, let's get started. Samir, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about how you increased 142% increase in top line growth for a luggage brand during the pandemic, which, I mean, uh, travel was down a little during the pandemic. So people buying luggage, that's pretty impressive. Uh, maybe they're buying it. And I, I don't I don't even want to get into consumer mentality. We're going to talk about that. But let's talk a little bit about Query first, what, what you all do and who you all work with. Yeah, so uh, Equir, we're a media buying agency for uh, high growth e-com and direct to consumer brands. So uh, we help our clients scale their growth, uh, kind of reach that next level and, and reach new consumers. Uh, and we do it through really smart advertising strategies, uh, everything from paid search and paid social, uh, also you know connected TV, podcast, uh, you know all of the above. Uh, the unique thing that we do is we've created. Uh, a really amazing uh, test and learn strategy. Uh, ad experimentation is really important, but that doesn't mean ad experimentation in the, I want to know what color button I want to put on my creative. It's really, what's the messaging? What's the audience? What are the channels? How are we doing experiments that are impactful um, for our clients? Uh, but then how are we prioritizing the things that matter? So we've created a really sophisticated system by which we do that. Uh, we do that for all of our clients and we drive incremental revenue from that. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the core insight for us was uh, Facebook and Harvard Business Review did a study and identified that e-com agencies that do ongoing ad experimentation increase their revenue 3 to 5% for every ad experiment they run. We've seen that pretty consistently, and that's how we've been able to grow our clients. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that makes, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the keys to creating good tests. Because we've been talking a lot about that, you know, I, yeah. I did an interview uh, recently. And we were talking about good tests, bad tests in in marketing, uh, and obviously, if you're doing, if you're growing this well, you're doing good tests. But I want to talk about the results. Tell me about this luggage brand that you 142 percent increase in top line growth. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, Delcy Luggage. They are uh, a very uh, big uh, brand out of uh, France and out of Paris. And they uh, have been around for a long time. They're awesome luggage. If you get a chance, take a, take a look at them. And uh, you know, we were able to really help them build out their e-com channel here uh, in the United States. And uh, they already had e-com. It existed as a, um, as a channel for them. And they really wanted to grow it. So we, we started working with them early on, and then, of course, COVID hit and everything had to change. Um, it, COVID for luggage brands, especially a luggage an international luggage brand like this one, had two major headwinds for them. So one, uh, no one's traveling. Yeah. <laughs> everything is shut down. So who's buying new luggage? But the second piece of it is, uh, and, and generally the piece that people forget about, is supply chain was a major issue. Uh, so top selling products are sold out for long periods of time. So two major headwinds, uh, and yet we we're still able to help them grow. We did that actually through a uh, really smart partnership with uh, our uh, partner there. Uh, so Michael Chapin is, is marketing there is probably one of the smartest marketers we've had the pleasure of working with. So uh, kind of when you bring those two together and you get, get a client that allows you to actually think outside the box and drive really good ideas, uh, you, you get some really good successes. So uh, everything from building out an intelligent media forecast that updated, uh, helped us allow, allowed us to move money to where we were able to get the most impact to uh, really prioritizing products and pre-sale 
uh, when demand would allow it. So, you know, top selling product is out of uh, stock. Can we start doing pre-sale for it? Or can we move, uh, can we highlight uh, other products that look similar? So uh, strategic thinking around that was how we were able to keep some of that demand as we were kind of going through COVID. So uh, I want to step back and look at whenever, you know, what that point where you're like, we have to change everything. What was, tell me about when you're looking at that, how did you do that? How did you make that shift? Because I think this is a super important thing that we don't talk about because, you know, COVID was big, but there's always these shifts that happen. And if you don't adapt to it and learn how to adapt to it, we're, you're going to, you're going to fail. But we always talk about this great idea, but we don't talk about what happens when things shift. How did you figure yeah. that shift out? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I think this is one of the benefits of media agencies over in-house teams, right? So we manage a series of clients. And so we're able to see these shifts before our clients do, right? Like you may look at your, your portfolio, you may look at your ad accounts and be like, oh yeah, no, we're just having like little volatility, just standard market shifts. But then when I get to look at it and our team looks at it and we look across all of our clients and everybody's seeing the same thing, we go, all right, maybe something is, something's up here. So, you know, our team has uh, weekly status updates across the entire portfolio where we're sharing these kinds of insights and information. So uh, that, that's one of the key things. So, you know, it's COVID, it's supply chain, it's uh, iOS 14, it's you know, TikTok launches, these are all market trends that, you know, you may not be able to see, but we do. And we see it across all of our clients. So, you know, you asked specifically, what was the thing? We saw everyone's growth start to flatline when everybody is off plan by 10%. We know something's going on and we got to revisit the entire portfolio, right? So, um, you know, Delcy is one of our uh, examples, a, a, a case study where we had a, a great success with them, but uh, there's definitely more of those because we ended up revisiting all of our clients' portfolios at that point, right? Like everybody had to shift strategy. Nobody really um, kind of just did what they did in 2019 all the way through COVID. Either you uh, shifted and pivoted and and had a great success like Delcy did, or you poured gas on the fire because what you were doing was already working and COVID just accelerated that, right? Um, but there definitely was uh, thinking uh, on all ends of it. Yeah, and it was, I mean, you talk about a dynamic situation too. It's, I mean, because everyone's mindset was shifting. We're, we're traveling again, we're not traveling again. I need luggage, no, I don't need luggage. I, I can spend it, you know, I, get, I got a ton of money from the government. Oh no, I don't have that money anymore. Um, it, you know, and, and you're doing, we're locked down. It's only going to be two weeks. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we laugh at that. Oh, two weeks. Uh, um, yeah. or, or yeah, we, we got a vaccine. Everyone's going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's crazy because it definitely has become just a, a way of life for us now. And to think that it's not impacting our strategies still moving forward. I mean, it's funny because you know you and I were talking about this, but we're in the middle of holiday, like holiday planning for our clients, and uh, to think that that's not going to play a major impact in how we forecast out expected returns for holiday or uh, you know potential demand for holiday, uh, it, it still is playing a major role in it. Supply chain and gas prices are still playing a major role in in how we look at consumer behavior in these pivotal moments. And so, tell me. You know, as you're shifting these strategies, what were the strategies that really worked? Like, especially for handling like a low and out of stock products, but what were the strategies that you developed and possibly even new strategies that you tested? Yeah, it, um, so I will say uh, media agencies and marketing agencies are really good at marketing themselves. And the best thing they do is they overcomplicate things. And so our agency at Query, we, one of our core, core values is simplicity is key. And so we really try and simplify things. So uh, if I were to tell you, oh yeah, there was like this single tactical thing that we did that changed everything, it's just, it's it's probably just BS. But the reality of it is, um, you know, the fundamentals are really important and the way you, you advertising strategy comes from mindset. So a lot of uh, brands and a lot of ad agencies 
before COVID and before iOS 14 and 25, we're really playing that arbitrage game. We're going to do a ton of Facebook ads and we're going to see some really great success and we're going to arbitrage the, the media spend against the revenue that we generate. We've never really played that game because uh, our thought process is it doesn't create sustainable growth for the long term. And we don't want to uh, be an agency that lives and dies by a growth hack. So. Our goal has always been, how do we build core fundamentals for our clients? How do we follow the customer journey? Uh, and how do we build campaigns that follow that customer journey and can be personalized to customers? So that's that's key one, right? Um, so for you know, Delcy and, and all of our brands, we're building out media campaigns that drive brand awareness, drive product consideration, and then ultimately drive conversion. Everything follows that that model. We then take that and then you ask, okay, great. So what did you guys do for Delcy during COVID? Well, product consideration changed during COVID. The things that mattered changed during COVID. And then also what could be considered changed during COVID. So it wasn't that our strategy shifted, but it's more um, how we implemented our framework and strategy shifted because it meant that we had to prioritize different products, update our messaging to figure out what works really well for during a COVID period. You know, stop talking about, oh, we're going to be traveling soon, right? Like, you're not traveling soon. Or how about no one was air traveling, but people were still car traveling and you still need luggage for car travel. So things like that. How do we kind of look at what consumers are doing for our clients? And when you have a framework like that, it becomes really easy because you have a series of questions you just want to answer. Why my product over somebody else? And how do we get that into advertising? Why my brand over others? What what gets us to actually connect with people? How do you get that into advertising? Um, and, and that's what we did. So core framework is important. The business, the media fundamentals, as I like to say them. Uh, and then after that, it's it's just optimizing those key elements. Nice. And and we were talking about before, and a lot, you did a lot of testing, correct? Yeah, we do. And, and how does that work? How, how do you figure out what tests to do and, and make sure it's a good test? Yeah, so we actually have a, a tool that we've created internally for um, all of our A-B tests. So we uh, uh, keep track. So we've created an internal database of all the A-B tests that we run for our clients. So it's broken out. Uh, actually, if you go to our website, you can see it. It's, uh, we are qry.com. Uh, on the homepage, we have what's called a learning agenda. You get a little screenshot of it. but. It's broken out as uh, what's the idea, what's our hypothesis that we think this test is going to do, what's the core KPI that it's going to impact, and then we break it out by uh, impact, how impactful do we think it's going to be, uh, and then uh, ease of actually launching it. And so we run all of this, and we're constantly prioritizing those. So that way, we're when we're running things, we're running things based on what we actually things that we think are going to actually lead to success, uh, things that we think are actually going to make an impact on the business. So that may be things like, um, I want to change how we message to our to our customers, uh, or I want to I want to test a different offer. Is it twenty percent off, or is it free expedited shipping? Uh, you know, is it uh, a bogo or free gift with purchase? Like things like that. Uh, that's what really impacts things. I don't really care if you want to test a green button versus a red button. Like the, it, the impact is going to be really minimal. Uh, but if I can drive, if I can run a test that drives real insights back to the business, uh, that can drive real impact, uh, you know, exponential change for the business, that that's a successful test. Love it. And, um, you know, when you find these successful tests, are you then making a new test? Are you are you finding new variants, or are you like, how are you a adding on to the tests that win? Yeah, yeah, it's, that's a great question. So, so the funny part about ecom advertising is um, a lot of so so unlike a lot of B two B or SaaS where your messaging is pretty standard and you're really iterating on messaging. Uh, Ecom and retail is great because every six weeks there's a new sale or a new message that needs to be messaged or something to, or a new product launch. So uh, we take what we learned from the previous, but then you know Labor Day sale uh, is going to happen or Q4 holiday sale is going to happen. We, we use that to inform those, but then we're running a test on that, which will then inform the next one. So we do get the opportunity to run the same test over and over again because the variables change 
from time to time. Uh, and so uh, for us, it's figuring out which are the most impactful tests, running those consistently, and then figuring out what is the iterative test after that that we need to do. Uh, but really, our, our perspective and our goal is big, impactful tests, not you know, small, we don't test for test sake. There's a cost to advertise. You know, cost, there's a cost to test. You, there's time and energy from my team that's being built into tests. Uh, if we're doing creative testing, you're paying to make two sets of creative. Uh, and then there's a test to analyze the results. So why would I test things unless I'm confident that it's going to be worth the cost to actually test it? Yes. And what's that threshold? <laughs> It depends. That's a client by client. So uh, it depends on their scale, right? Uh, if you're spending multiple millions in advertising, well, then the threshold can be a lot smaller because a, an incremental change has huge impacts across the campaign. If you're not spending that much, well, then the threshold needs to be really big to make it worthwhile, right? So it, that that's kind of the question mark. Um, the other thing, too, it's got to be something that can inform our next round. So an example might be, you know, I think we're running this test for one of our clients right now of, do we want our product feeds to have lifestyle images or product flats? Okay, well, let's test it and find out what performs better. Um, that may not continue to perform better in perpetuity, so we'll want to revisit that test, but at least for the next, you know, three months, we'll know. Uh, and then, you know, we'll find out, so, so that'll be test one. We run it across the brand, but then maybe there's certain categories that work better as lifestyle versus product flats. So then we'll iterate on and do it by the category level. So that's these are the kinds of questions that we want. And um, our number one core value is curiosity for the agency. And so everyone lives that core value. And, and the what if question gets asked a lot or the why question gets asked a lot. So uh, that usually leads to the major tests that we're doing or an incremental for sure nice, after that. Nice. And so what types of media are you seeing working the best right now? Is it a case by case basis? Are there certain trends that you're like, Oh, this is the best type of media right now for, for a lifestyle brand. Yeah. You know, what's really funny is everyone keeps ranting and raving about how Facebook is not working for them, but you know, Facebook still continues to work for us and we're able to actually see some really good results from it. Um, I think the people that complain about Facebook and Meta not working for them are really, they were looking at it from a lens of uh, it's going to always drive revenue for us. But our perspective has always been, it's a discovery channel. Uh, it is where you introduce your brand to people and you're pushing them uh, to explore you for the first time. So from, uh, from an advertising standpoint, uh, Facebook Meta still continuing to work for us google and performance max if you have not tried it if you're not running it please call us we'll help you with it you should absolutely be running it uh TikTok has seen some really good results and then honestly ctv has been a really good channel for us for uh building brand awareness you know again i go back to what is the purpose of our agency the purpose of our agency is to help scale brands so we spend a lot of time thinking about performance media for sure we want to maximize the dollars there uh, but once those dollars are maximized a lot of our time gets spent on how do we get more people into the funnel how do we build a larger audience pool so we spend a lot of time and energy thinking about top of funnel advertising meta uh, facebook instagram uh, ctv you know, podcasts, another opportunity nice, as well. Nice. And by podcast, are you ad advertising on it, guesting, doing one, all of the above? <laughs> uh, it'll be a lot of, um, so for, for some of our clients that we've already seen successes, um, host reads have been really good for us for getting some, some uh, awareness out there. It's definitely on a case by case basis, depending on the client. Uh, and the product specifically. So if you've got a product that's uh, that lends itself to be host read by a celebrity and it's going to do really well, great. Those are the kinds of podcasts that we want to be on. Nice, nice. And um, you know, video is a big deal to me. So what you know, what trends are you seeing in video, especially on lifestyle brands uh, th that's working in, in the ad space? Yeah, I'd say the biggest thing for video. Um, uh, and, and one of the mistakes a lot of people are making right now is they make a YouTube video and then cut it for Meta and TikTok, or they create a you know 
an Instagram reel are like, this is going to be great on every channel. And the reality of the situation is it's not. Uh, if you're not thinking about the platform that you're creating the video for, it's not going to perform well. And so uh, we really recommend our clients sit and think about creative. And, uh, you know, we're a media agency. We don't do creative. So we end up doing a lot of creative briefs and recommendations around creative uh, best practices. And uh, that's that's our one is think about the platform, think about the placement, think about the messaging on, on that platform. Um, and so that that's been really important for us. Yeah. And it, it, and it makes sense. I think everyone's come from the idea that an ad is an ad is an ad. And let's just take that commercial and put it everywhere. Right. <laughs> Yeah. No. And it's interesting, though, because uh, we we also tell our clients don't go too far. So, so if you're going to say it's like a pendul- if, if it's like a pendulum. Right. And one side is we're going to just take this 60 second TV ad that we created, cut it up and put it in every channel. That's the side of the pendulum. And then you've got the other side of the pendulum where uh, we're going to have a different campaign on every <laughs> every platform. You, you want to be in the middle. Right. Like you want the same yeah. messaging, the same campaign. You should be showing up in the same way. It's just uh, how you're doing it is different. Um, and, and that like look and feel needs to be different. Length, energy levels, those are all you know different on the different platforms. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, and when you're looking at, uh, like you're saying, an overall campaign and you're looking at creative, I like the fact that you're so focused because I feel like it's really tough for people to be really great at creative and really great at the ads. Um, so how are you help guiding them to who to go for, for creative? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, um, a series of creative partners that we uh, love and that we work with pretty regularly. And, uh, you know, we made a strategic decision early on not to do creative because, um, you, it's hard to be really, to be a really good creative agency for a whole gamut of audiences. I think the best creative agencies have a point of view and have uh, a look and feel and are really good at that look and feel. So for example, like we've got great creative agencies for luxury premium products because they really understand that world and speak to it. And then we've got, you know, high energy, um, you know, creative agencies that are really good at high energy lifestyle products and, and like, you know, outdoor products, things like that. So creative agencies tend to have a strong suit for them where they're really good at uh, certain areas or certain audiences. Um, because our agency kind of runs across e-com, our, our target is e-com and direct to consumer. We know that world, we know how consumers want to purchase and, and that it was hard for us to say, okay, we're going to focus on this one audience set or this single type of product. Uh, so what we do is we'll connect you with the right agency that we think is a good fit that we've worked with in the past. Love it. I, it's so important. It, it, I think it's a, it's a great distinction because I think I feel like everyone wants everything all at once, and it's really tough. To I, I know that's yeah. because it's you know I spend all my time learning all this stuff, and I'm like I get overwhelmed. I'm like I can't imagine someone who's not spending all their time understanding any of it, um, and to be yeah. the best. And, and which it seems like yeah. you all are. So tell me about working I, with. with uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we don't leave our creative partners out in the wind. So it, I think the the best successes come when the creative partner and the media agency are working really well together. And so, you know, our team is doing creative briefing. We're very transparent around what's working and what's not. We give them all the information they need to build the best creative messaging possible. Um, and sometimes our clients are doing that internal because they may have a creative team, but sometimes it's, it's with, you know, an external creative partner. Love it. Awesome. So, uh, tell me about working with Query. How, who, you know, who's your ideal client? How do, how does it work? Yeah. So, our ideal clients um, are brand spending at least you know fifty k in advertising a month. Uh, kind of feeling that plateau, like they've been trying. It, it, you know, I, I laugh because if you if you jump on a call with me or one of our sales team and and you say, hey, you know, we've been doing this for a while and we try and spend more money on advertising, but we just get the same amount of money back. It's time to call us. Uh, we're really good at getting our clients past that plateau, uh, really thinking about how to do it in a different way. Uh, we have a great article on the five stages of e-com growth uh, that kind of lays that out. Um, you know, the problems that you're probably feeling at that level, uh, why you're feeling it. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of who, who we tend to work with. 
you know, 50K is our, uh, 50K a month is where we start to see successes, but really the, the clients that see the best successes from us are the ones that are able to spend at least 150 a month uh, and have hopes of spending much more than that because uh, we can quickly scale you guys and, and have the, the tools and resources to be able to do that. Love it. And, um, and where's the best place to follow you? Where are you spending your time? Uh, LinkedIn is definitely the best place to find me. So it's Samir Balwani on LinkedIn. Uh, I post there pretty regularly. Uh, also follow us on our blog. Uh, we have a newsletter, sign up. Uh, we publish uh, key KPI benchmarks on there as well as lots of how-to content. Um, you know, Our goal is to just be helpful as much as possible. So it's all out awesome. there. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Samir. Thank you so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was great. Awesome, and thanks for taking Samir and I on your journey. Make sure to check out Query. Uh, this has been I and Garlic and the Garlic Marketing Show.